to see if you turn it on. We're live. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Town of Vesuvius Committee of the Whole Meeting, uh, March the 8th, 2022, in Council Chambers. Call the meeting to order, and um, first off, we need. <laughs> I'm getting feedback now, am I? <laughs> Um, and first off, we need to do the approval of the agenda, and I'm checking to see if there are any late items. No, there's no, not. Thank you very much. Could we have a motion? Thank you. Councillor Bennett, Councillor King, all in favor? Thank you. And the adoption of the Committee of the Whole Minutes from February the 22nd. Councillor Harvey, Councillor King, all in favor? Thank you. And uh, first off, we have uh, we have a couple of um, uh, petitions, delegations today. And the first one is the Suez Desert Center uh, annual presentation. And um, we'd like to welcome Jamie Bright. Jamie, would you like to come up to the to the? Is there? She just is. is there, can everybody see if Jamie comes up this far? Yes, and she will be on the screen too. Is she? She will be. No, no, no. Yeah, she is. She is. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you, for coming today. Thank you, Councillors, for having us here today. I know I'm joined uh, online uh, by Deb, uh, Deb Sherwood, who is our secretary, and her husband Bob, and uh, Lori Watt is also joining us today. He's our treasurer. If you have any financial questions, uh, I'm sure he can help us out. And in the uh, room, we have Birgit Arnstein, who's also a board uh, member. So thanks for having us. Um, I, uh, I, I hate to leave with bad news, but I'm just going to get it over. <laughs> like uh, many people in businesses in 2021, uh, tourism in particular, uh, it was certainly challenging for the Soyuz Desert Center. Uh, the travel restrictions due to COVID, as well as the heat dome and province-wide wildfires, really hurt our bottom line during the 2021 season. And uh, admissions were already down uh, from 2020. Um, so it was a difficult year. Uh, thankfully, we were able to take advantage of some employment and COVID relief uh, funding opportunities to help, help offset those um, reductions in, in income. And we also got really great support from individuals and corporate donors, which helped uh, tremendously. So as we head into 2022, we do so with conscious <coughs> optimism. Um, as many of you know, we were uh, given a grant by the province of BC, the Community Economic Recovery Infrastructure Program grant. And so we have been working this winter on replacing our 1.5 kilometer boardwalk. And uh, this is a really exciting and uh, momentous occasion really for the organization that will literally walk us into the future. Um, we are thrilled. Uh, we are very pleased, uh, we're very pleased to award the contract, uh, which was sent out to um, a bidding process. Um, we were very pleased to award it to C3 Industries local company, um, allowing us to honor the objective of the grant, which was to infuse um, economic benefit into our local economy and create jobs. Uh, I'm not sure if any of you have had a chance, but there is some really uh, great footage of the um, construction. Um, it was captured by C3 staff member Ethan McMullen uh, in its drone footage. You can go on to the uh, Soyuz Desert Center YouTube uh, page, a channel, and you'll be able to see all the different, um, I think he's created so far four or five in there. They're little snippets of the construction process. So it's really interesting to see it happen along the way. And uh, yeah, we're, we're nearing the end now. Um, so uh, we hope to open this season on April 23rd. So we're nearing the end and it's, it's getting really exciting. Uh, winter was a little challenging with the, with the weather in December and January and February, uh, with the amount of snow that we got and the ground being frozen for so long. Um, it was a bit challenging, but things are, are moving full steam ahead now. So it's very exciting. 
Um, I know that I was here last fall uh, to talk to you a little bit about the disposal of the boardwalk that we were um, quite uh, shocked to hear that it could be up to $250,000 in disposal fees, but I'm happy to tell you that we over the uh, since the uh, project started on, uh, I think October 15th was a start day. Up until today, we have been uh, putting out uh, information on our social media platforms to let people know that they can come and pick up the lumber. And it is just going great. I mean, people are coming in droves with flatbed trailers. They're exciting, excited to recycle the wood. We've had people from the Nature Trust of BC out. So they're going to be reusing the wood. We've had uh, um, Ryan Hendricks from Safe Rush Nurseries who's, who's uh, going to be uh, using the wood on his property. All sorts of farmers um, and ranchers around the area have come. So we um, are quite, quite confident that we will be able to dispose of most of it. There's some pieces that are not um, uh, going to be uh, good enough to reuse, so we'll have to uh, dispose of that, but we're, it's going very, very well. So we're really, really, really happy about that for sure. Um, I did want to mention that there has been a, a key um, volunteer position that's helped us with the uh, boardwalk construction. Uh, he's an integral and invaluable member. Uh, it's Larry Stone, and he was um, you probably know him for his uh, role in helping with the uh, Osoyoos Museum, the new construction of the uh, Osoyoos Museum. And uh, just right off that uh, project, he jumped up, jumped in with us and uh, helped, started to help us with our boardwalk construction, which is really amazing. And he's got you know, over 40 years of construction experience, and he's just been a really, really great help. So thank you, Larry. Um, there's also other volunteers uh, that are at the heart and soul of this um, this year in particular, uh, and that is our boardwalk uh, committee. Um, Peter Beckett, Roger Horton, and Trevor Reeves stepped up in a big way. It's, uh, it's been challenging and uh, exciting, but really, really um, the, 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 the tasks that these guys have taken uh, taken on just in the boardwalk construction alone is incredible. So I just going to give a shout out to them. Uh, they've also been involved in uh, uh, installing the sentinels at our gate there that were, um, the old ones were ready to come out. They were uh, rotting. And uh, so we've installed some new ones there. We've also installed a couple of uh, wine barrel, uh, water barrels uh, at the site and covered our, um, our pergola in the doorways to keep rain out. So really big uh, thanks to our building committee. Of course, um, the rest of the uh, activities at the Desert Center require volunteers as well, including our admissions desk uh, and our restoration of site maintenance crews um, removing invasive species, pruning and, and transplanting native species. Um, so yeah, thank you very much to all the volunteers for sure. We couldn't do that, um, our job without them for sure. Um, we were really thrilled to be a part of a couple of great community fundraisers this past summer. Penticton's Tin Whistle Brewing Company helped to uh, help out our restoration efforts by donating uh, to us, five cents from any every can of their prickly pear, queen of tart, um, cactus sour beer that they produced. And they presented us with a uh, nice donation at the end of the season. Um, and we also were received, um, uh, we also were part of a, an event that was held by the um, Soyuz Home Building Center. And that was, um, they had uh, Chef Joe, uh, from the Chef de Partie at the Bear, the Fish, the Root, and the Berry to come out and create this amazing smoked corn salad on the Traeger grill. And so it was a really, really lovely day. So we're really, really pleased to be part of those uh, community businesses and, and really um, have some fun and also raise some funds. Um, we were able through some employment grants uh, this year. Um, we were helped out with those employment grants to uh, Canada Summer Jobs and Eco Canada to hire three 
uh, conservation tour guides. Uh, so Andres Lancero Barreto, who's a, a University of British Columbia Okanagan student, student studying ecology and evolutionary bi biology, joined us on staff. Shannon Erickson, who's a sports management student at Thompson University College, um, helped out on staff as well. And the Soyuz Secondary School uh, student, Pradnar Samar, joined our staff. Andreas gave two great uh, nature talks in August, Eat or Be Eaten, uh, looked at how species survive and interact in search of food, and to be or not to be spotlighted pollinators and why they are so critically tied to our uh, sustainability. Uh, Shannon Erickson gave a hands-on bluebird nest box uh, building workshop called For the Birds, and this event sold out in a second, uh, provided step-by-step -step instructions to build your own home nest, nest box, as well as discussions about bluebird ecology. And the third talk, Living with Rattlesnakes, uh, was presented by Deep uh, Desert Cultural <coughs> Center snake biologist Chloe Howard, who showed us how to identify different state snake species. So those events were really well attended, and with the restrictions with COVID, we've been quite kind of quiet in that area for the last two years, but we were able to um, hold these events outdoors at the Village Center, so we were really thrilled to do that. Um, COVID also has, has hindered our ability to uh, have school and group programs, but I, again, uh, this past summer, we are able, with restrictions lifted, to have a few school and group tours out, including the um, OSNS Child and Youth Development Center, the Cactus Kids Camp, uh, Sumokini Elementary School, uh, UBC Forestry Field Trip, uh, Penticton Newcomers Club, and San Pax Chin School. Uh, so the uh, groups toured our facility and learned all about our antelope brush desert habitat here and our conservation efforts. And um, yeah, the, the grade six and seven students from Senpak Chin also volunteered to help install some new Luber nest boxes around the site. So that was really great too. Um, it's always great to have uh, those kinds of educational programming um, happen for sure. Uh, this summer in conjunction with the Antelope Brush Ecosystem and Restoration Project that we're involved in, um, uh, funded by the South Okanagan Conservation Fund, Environment and Can Climate Change Canada, and Habitat Conservation Trust Foundation. Uh, staff member Andres Mancera Barreto conducted a Bears Hair Streak survey at the uh, Soyuz Desert Center. Um, the the uh, um, first of those surveys was, were, was conducted 18 years ago, and it's sort of designed to understand. Um, the current state of the red listed bears hair streak, um, who rely on antelope brush for their survival, um, gauging how the population has changed over, over that time. And unfortunately, the numbers uh, that were observed indicate a decline in population, um, but we'll continue to monitor. We're not sure if that the decline um, was a result of the heat dome, which, which certainly um, hindered uh, also uh, Bluebird um, nests this year were, were in decline as well because of the, of the heat dome. So we'll continue to monitor that and hopefully we'll see those numbers improve. Other uh, restoration work and conservation work going on at the Desert Center include hummingbird surveys, work on the pond and space but habitat, and of course the bluebird monitoring prevention. Um, I want to give a, th a thanks to Destination of Soyuz and their team of members uh, who helped with um, marketing the Soyuz Desert Center. Thanks to their work, we had several travel bloggers come through, uh, and a travel writer from Calgary, Alberta, who um, who put a nice article in the Calgary Herald about the Soyuz Desert Center. We also had uh, an Expedia photographer out, and of course, thanks um, also to our local and regional uh, media. Oh, the, uh, the Times Chronicle, the Pentic and Western News, Castanet, and Kermes Review also put in uh, several articles about um, the Soyuz Desert Center. Um, looking forward, uh, we are hoping to uh, continue, of course, with our educational programming, have more spring school programs and you know, fall school programs. Um, We'll, we'll look towards resuming our winter programs uh, this coming season, depending on how things um, pan out. Um, 
doing some workshops, community presentations, special events, those sorts of things. And then, of course, uh, increasing our group tours and working more closely with tour operators. Um, our boardwalk, I think, goes a long way in, in uh, allowing us to have a really uh, wonderful uh, tourism product here and, and sort of elevates that tourism experience. Um, one of the things that we weren't able to do, it was part of our boardwalk grant, but unfortunately it wasn't funded, um, but we're hoping to still get some funding and we're working on that right now is to construct a 20 by 45 pergola to provide shade uh, um, and protect us from the from inclement weather on in our big open area space, and we want to do that because it will allow us to expand our our programming into the winter and shoulder seasons. Um, it will, of course, enhance visitor experience and and uh, develop stronger ties with tour operators who can perhaps bring people in to have like a little lunch and then tour the desert center when it's plus forty degrees out there. It's impossible to sit. Um, in that open space, so pergola is really going to help with that. And also, when it's uh, if it's raining or windy, you know, our idea is to have a pergola that we can have uh, removable uh, walls and uh, roofs, so that if if it is raining or if it's really windy and we're having an event out there, we can enclose the space. So um, yeah, that's a really uh, one of the things that we're really excited about and looking forward to. Um, to building and, and talk, um, uh, uh, increasing the infrastructure at the desert center. Um, so finally, um, our year-end financials, uh, they continue to look good despite the challenges. Uh, our core funders play a critical role in, um, in that success that we have and, and, and have had in weathering these challenges, the town of the soils, of course. Um, the RDOS and the province of BC gaming. Um, we couldn't definitely couldn't do it without you all. Um, we were also able to take uh, some emergency help from government with the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy and the Regional Relief and Recovery Fund. That really helped. So as I said, moving forward, we are cautiously optimistic. And I did want to absolutely take this last moment to thank the town of Osoyas. Um, your $15,000 annual funding allows us to continue to promote Osoyas as a vibrant tourism destination, uh, helps support local community programs, events, and projects. Uh, it helps us to pay for expenses that are not covered by other funders. And, um, it makes a big difference, as I mentioned, in what the center has and will continue to accomplish. So thank you all very much. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you very much for coming and presenting all these great things that are happening. So we're very pleased that, um, that the boardwalk was able to be built and it's almost done. It'll yes. be done by April. It should be done by the beginning of April, absolutely. Probably like the first week in April. Good. <laughs> and and I, I was talking to Larry Stone the other day, so I did know that most of the wood had been um, picked up. And what a cool way to end that one, because we were all quite concerned about what was going to happen to it and how we were going to help you get so great. Nice. We're really happy about that. Mm -hmm. So, um, and thank you for the um, the financials. Um, that's more than we usually get. <laughs> so that's um, that's very interesting. So I'm just going to see if anybody um, at the table here has any questions or anything they would like to ask about. Go ahead, Councilor. Just Jane. ask: Is there an increase in the hummingbirds, or were they down also? Hummingbirds were down also. Yes. Yeah, all the wildlife suffered. It was it was hot. Yeah, it was very hot. hot. So and and the snakes too were they? Um, I'm not actually sure about the snakes. Um, we didn't do a survey on the snakes. So um, yeah, they like the heat. Yeah, but it was hot. It was really hot. I think when it gets that hot. It has its effects for oh, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. On everybody <laughs> and everything. Yeah. So, well, oh, go ahead, Councilor Bennett. Jim, just a question. <clears throat> the sign out by the highway, I, I just don't buy the other day and I'm trying to think, it's not very, there's not a great big sign saying, well, there's a pretty small sign, is it? 
The one that's right on uh, 97? Yeah. Yeah, so I contacted the Ministry of Transportation that has jurisdiction over those signs. And um, because it's kind of the one that it, when you drive north is really fading because it gets that south sun all the time. And so I asked them about um, if we could replace that. And they said that they, we could replace it, but it would have to be a smaller sign. Uh, and that, they, that they're not um, allowing uh, people to have such big signs anymore on the highway. Um, and so I thought, well, it's a, rather than have a smaller sign, I'll, I'll leave it as is. Um, the one that's coming, uh, when we travel southbound is in better condition. It's it's easier to see. One of the things that we are trying to do is um, is contact some homeowners along the highway and see if we can get a big um, like billboard type thing put on their on their property. But uh, yeah, because I was thinking that a lot of times when you have tourists up like that, there's a sign the actual highway sign up on the highway signs it turns information so people going by and, there is uh, one there there's one it yeah it's it's um just before you turn off onto 146 but like i said it's kind of the one when you travel northward uh, northbound is really fading but yeah so to be fair the um sign bylaws we do have uh, a sign bylaw in town limits that limits the types of signs because as you know uh, some of the businesses along the highway put up huge signs and many signs and oftentimes they are a hazard to drivers it's uh it's difficult to focus on what you're doing and they get lost in amongst all the other signs so it's been quite a topic of conversation not only in town limits, but also at the RDOS table. Um, and we have talked to the Minister of, of Highways because we were concerned, the directors at the table, about the number of signs there and how much, uh, you know, there is a, there's a real problem in seeing it and concentrating. So that's maybe why they don't want you to put up a bigger sign there because um, they've been listening to the if the death defendant did that, then everybody else would want him to be put up bigger, bigger signs too. And sometimes it's a little overwhelming. And that's our concern yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So um, we, I'm not sure that you can get people on the highway to put up billboards on their property. I, I'm not saying you can't. I just think that there might be some concern. Sure. Asking people to do that. Right. However, um, we certainly appreciate all of the work that they, um, that you and your committee do out there. And we're looking forward to a busier season this year. And um, I will see you on the 23rd, the opening. Great. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you Thank very you. much. <laughs> Uh, our next um, delegation is from the Asuyas Lake Water Quality Society. And um, uh, Mrs. Arnstein, are you going to speak first? Yes, please. Okay, go ahead. Thank you very much. Good morning. Can Thank I, you very much. I just wanted to, is it okay if I'm up there as well? You know, um, I'll okay. call you. Why okay. don't you just sure. sit there and you can come up next? Um, you could you take off your mask in order to speak? Are you comfortable with that? I yes, it's if, if everyone's us. comfortable yes. with me. Yes, yes. that's fine. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for uh, enabling us to speak with you this morning. Um, I just have to let you know that I have um, a number of board members here. Well, we have John Gates, our major uh, data collector. We have a new board member, Mark Karstad, in the very back. We have Dave Kumka, our board member, and Ian Fraser is our boat manager. And Ian is going to be showing pictures, full pictures up as I speak. Sure. Um, I'm here to address uh, council and staff regarding the Osiris Lake Water Quality Society's need for moorage at Sunrise Marina. Um, the Water Quality Society has been monitoring Osiris Lake since the early 90s, as most of you know. Uh, we are a wholly volunteer driven organization. The data we collect goes to the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change. Our data has been used 
to determine the health of the lake and evaluate what effects climate change may have on the lake. Um, our sensitive equipment, including the Hydrolab 4, which for short we call the SOND, uh, is connected to a computer on the boat, and that is connected to a big, long, heavy cable all on the boat. The SOND is, a, uh, and um, the, then the cable is with the SOND attached is dropped into the lake at two meter intervals. Um, it provides. We have those pictures okay. in the yeah. package that uh, that Birgit sent. Thank you yes. so. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, I'm holding them up. We've yeah, got them right here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, it it provides uh, and and when talking about the cable rack, that's one of the ones I'm going to be referring to again later. But you'll see it there with. It's not a great picture, but it's John and myself and the cable rack on the boat. You see that. Yeah, um, it's really quite heavy, but we need it because the cable's got fiber optic stuff in it and so you can't kink it. So it has to, John designed the lovely contraption for us. Anyway, we uh, collect, uh, we do sampling in um, four areas of the lake, two on the south side of the lake and two on the north side of the lake. Um, and we test for uh, pH, temperature, dissolved oxygen, specific conductance. And then we also monitor um, water clarity with the sucky disc, which is another clunky piece of equipment. And in past years, we also participated in collecting water samples test for belladurs, which are the larval forms of zebra and quagga mussels. Our data manager, John Gates, is uh, is going to be awarded the Volunteer of the Year for the BC Lake Stewardship Society. Uh, you know, this will happen next week. And that's because of his data, uh, excellence in data collection and management. His work is highly valued. Um, so, uh, for several years, we have enjoyed Walnut Beach, the help of Walnut Beach. They have allowed us to moor our boat throughout the summer months at their lovely dock and they have a storage room and they've enabled us to keep most of our equipment in the storage room during the summer months. Uh, they are unable to provide that for us anymore and now we need help. Um, we very much appreciated all the help from the town from the public works yard where we star our boat through the winter months. Um, we, we appreciate um, the use of the Sonora Center in the basement. We keep um, a lot of our printed material, some of our life jackets, all sorts of stuff is kept down there. And we appreciate that as well. And then we are enabled to occasionally have a meeting in Sonora Center. We also appreciate that. We have very specially trained volunteers who carry on bi-weekly tests. Since COVID, we've reduced our volunteer numbers on board to four or five, never more than five. Our captain, data manager, and volunteers handle the specialized cable and uh, sound, and they need to be able to board the boat safely while safely loading all of that expensive equipment. Um, the insurance on our sound is, I think, over a thousand bucks. It's it's pricey stuff and we have to protect it. Um, so they have to load the gas tank, the computer, the sound, that heavy rack. Can you bring up that picture again? That very heavy rack. I'll just, uh, you see this, this is actually transported. This big frame is transported onto the boat with a rolling trolley. So like up to the boat and then we, two people carry it over onto the boat. Um, and you'll see that that connects over here to, a, that's our computer, it's under a tent because of the sun's shining down. Um, it's, uh, it requires sort of a easy, safe way of getting it on the boat, onto the boat. Um, without having an easy access and safe access, to our boat, um, 
the more difficult we make it in that that frame is quite heavy, the more difficult we make it, it'll be more difficult to hold on to volunteers because um, we're all a little bit getting on in years. <laughs> and it's your uh, birthday yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, you know, so schlepping some of that stuff can be challenging. Anyway, so we have looked at, um, uh, we have looked at other alternatives, which I'll get to in a moment. Um, our boat is a 19 foot pontoon boat and we own the boat and we own the trailer. Um, uh, without having a spot at the marina or somewhere, and these are our possible options, but they all have challenges. The first option would be uh, to launch the boat every two weeks. We go up every two weeks, but that would require us to get permission to keep the and come in and out twice a day on that given day um, and every two weeks at Public Works. Um, it would um, put a great deal of strain on any on the boat and trailer and any vehicle that is pulling it. It also requires a couple of um, skilled people to launch and then retrieve the boat every two weeks. Um, this, this puts um, a huge load on our volunteers. We don't have a truck designated for pulling the trailer and so on. Um, added costs, of course, and wear and tear on all of the equipment. Um, it would mean that uh, we would be doing 22 trips uh, from May to October, in and out, in and out, um, as opposed to normally what we do is we take it out in the spring, the boat out of public works, we launch it, it stays in the water until October when we pull it out and bring it back up to its lovely resting place in uh, public works. Another option would be to attach the boat to a buoy. This would require, this has challenges as well, and it would require that we'd have to get permission from federal, provincial, possibly, depending on where the buoy would be put, possibly also involving the town. You know, it, you have to get a lot of permissions to be able to do that. Um, there are difficulties with that we need. Probably we would need a dinghy to get ourselves out to that buoy, to the boat that's attached to the buoy. If it didn't do that, if the buoy was within sort of wading out distance, we start around 8.30 in the morning. It would mean that the captain would have to wait out there. And, and in the mornings, because I've volunteered on the boat, it's cool in the mornings, out there, wading out into the boat, then you're wet. For four hours, you're wet on the boat. And that you're not going to hold on to any captain that's going to want to do that for very long. Uh, so that is a huge challenge. Um, and then there are winds and waves that can play havoc on the boat when it's attached to this buoy. And as we know that even in Vancouver, there the freighter that dropped, lost its anchor, things can come unattached. Can you imagine that boat going who knows where? Stuff happens like that. Um, the other possibility is a private dock. And indeed, um, we have been going around and canvassing uh, uh, businesses as well as individual people. I have literally gone door knocking on people. I see someone has a dock and I pound on their door and politely ask. And so far, we haven't been successful with that. If we did, um, the challenges with getting um, a private dock, many of those happen to be exposed to fairly open water. There's the winds, wind and waves. Um, there are also the wake boats, which would provide more movement and wind and wave. Um, most likely, if we had a private dock, we would have to um attach or put in a lift a boat lift that that's complicated it's um i talked with the fellow that services lifts boat lifts in town and uh he he could maybe get us one he has one right now ten thousand dollars 
that's a used one. It still needs to be, um, and but I don't know how long he'll have that because they're very in short supply and they're upwards or more than $20,000 new. They need to be uh, serviced regularly. Um, when speaking with him, I asked about doing a hand crank lift. He recommended against it, and particularly since we do have, may I say, aging <laughs> volunteers, cranking uh, a lift can be difficult. So it has to be electrical, either to an electrical source on land or um, solar and batteries, which then also need to be serviced, and that's an additional cost. Um, so, uh, and on a private property, and, and I know a couple of private people, one who has a wonderful dog, but he, he can't let us use his property because we would be going right in through his property, his private area past his swimming pool to get over to his dog. That's just, that's not going to work. And so that is a challenge. And particularly because, we, again, we have all that equipment that we must move onto the dock when we've got all the people to load. Um, it's, it's a headache. Um, so uh, the private docks have their challenges. Um, so as I said, we put out a public appeal so far, nothing has come through that has worked for us. It's not that we're not trying, we certainly like to do that. We are requesting moorage at the town's Sunrise Marina for our boat from May to October. We understand that there's a wait list and we would like to appeal, but we'd like to appeal to the town to prioritize our requests because of, we're not doing this for our, good health. Well, we're doing it for the health of the lake. We're doing it as a service to our community and to our greater community. Um, without safe and easily accessible moorage for our boat, the important work of this society would likely have to end. Uh, we recommend that the town consider our request that we can continue so that the continuity of lake monitoring and resultant lake management may continue. I've provided you with the pictures, which hopefully you'll have a good look at. I've also provided you with a um, detailed uh, report written by the BC Lake Stewardship Society recently. And they cite all of our data and it's, it's a valuable piece of information. And had we not been out on the lake, that report could not have been written. And that report is not just used for Osunus Lake, that report has been recognized as sort of a general description of what happens on lakes, but Osunus Lake Water Quality Society is the most advanced in lake monitoring. So they've used our lake monitoring as a template for information on other lakes in British Columbia. Um, and they very much value our work, and you will see a letter from John Romeo of BCLS as supporting our work. And you'll also see a letter from Kirsten McNeil of uh, BC Environment and Climate Change, to whom our data goes, and uh, the, the ministry of that group did. And uh, they, they too would be sad to see us stop our operation. Thank you very much for the opportunity to let me speak. Thank you. Did Ian, did you have anything else that you wanted to include? No, in, in order to meet the time configuration, we yes. changed up how we were going to present it. Not a problem. Um, we do certainly appreciate all the information that you have uh, provided to us. And, uh, and uh, you know, we, we understand the value of, of your work. Um, certainly the Okanagan Basin Water Board understands the value of what you're doing. So does the International Lake of Cities Board of Control. So um, I, I, it's most interesting to have a look at not only your pictures, but all of the reports that you have included in here. And, um, and, and I thank you for your continued work. And I'll see if council has any questions. Go ahead, Councillor Bennett. Just, just one more <clears throat> comment. I, I run my background's insurance. 
Okay. And I think if you start talking to private, somebody with a private home, and you try to do that, and they went to the insurance company saying they're going to allow you to go in their dock, they may have trouble with their insurance because now you got a whole bunch of people coming in off that dock, and it's kind of might be considered like commercial zoning and not a, a, a what you need. Yeah. You might have problems with that. So that's just one more thing. Yeah. <laughs> Another reason why we need your help. Yeah. 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 Thank you. So, oh, go ahead, Councilor. Yeah, thank you, Member. First, I want to thank you and all your volunteers for the great work you do uh, monitoring our lake. Just in general terms, you, are you kind of, is the lake doing better or worse or kind of consistent over the last couple of years? I would like to defer to John Gates, That's our data manager. Yeah. I mean, I got a lot of data here. Just yeah, but John can answer that. I, you know, why not let the experts? John, would you like to come up and uh, now John is very knowledgeable and he also um, knows a lot of things and um, and talks for a long time. So exactly. John, just so that you know, I'm going to put a time limit on, on it because he could go on for hours. <laughs> um, well, I believe in citizen science and I'm very grateful for governments encouraging that. I also believe very strongly in science and facts and the data we've been collecting uh, over the summer period um, uh, shows the lake is actually in a very good condition. Um, what we're collecting is data, which is probably better than past data because in 2018, we took on a sonnet, which is an electronic instrument, mm -hmm. uh, which is um, using current technology. And it puts its data there directly onto a computer. So we went from a paper stage to mostly electronic. And that, to me, was a big step forward. It was a challenge, but it was a big step forward. And um, but what we're doing is only monitoring. We're looking at the status of the lake. So at the end of the season, the environment get a copy of our data. The copy goes on the website for public viewing. But it's only a status. If things start to go wrong, sure, we can start to pick up what's going on. But I am a person that believes the lake. Well, it's a natural world, are under a big threat in today's society. Um, and that threat is human beings. And we're very much so. And so we've got what, 7.8 million billion people on one planet, moving to 10 billion predictive. And we seem to have almost infinite choices in what we can do. It's very dangerous. I see that lake. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the lake today is okay so far, but we'll find out a bit more this summer. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I'm sorry, John. No, we appreciate learning from you, but they have limited time. Yeah. Can okay, I also you. say, John, that um, mm. I, as the chair of the water board, am, we are sending a letter today to Minister Heyman concerning not just the Suez Lake, but the, the health of the lakes all up and down the wow. valley. We continue to do that as well, because our main reason for doing that is that we do not want zebra quagga mussels to invade our lake. So we are doing anything and everything that we can to try and prevent it. Just, you know, and what you guys do is very, very helpful as well. So I thank you so much. Cool. Um, I would just like to say, I'm sorry to do this, but Ian provided me just now with two maps showing our test sites. I haven't provided that in your enclosures, but if I may give it to Amy and then she can circulate that, is that sure. fair? That would be fine. Thank you very thank you. much. So um, I certainly understand that this is um, that this is a huge concern, and we understand your reasons for wanting us to have a look at this. I'm just wondering if uh, staff could come back with a report on 
what the status of our, I think we have 20 spots at the, at the marina, 10 of them belong to the town and 10 of them belong to Watermark Beach Resort. Um, is it possible to have a look at the status of those and perhaps talk to Watermark and see if there is some way, I know we have a long waiting list uh, of people that want to take our spots. Could that be done, Mr. Tackle? Yes. Thank you very much. So I we can't guarantee anything, but we can certainly look at what are the options. If I may just, I'm sorry, one more thing. We we normally test, begin testing in the spring. So we have a bit of a time limit and I wasn't given that much notice from Walnut Beach. So I'm working sure. on trying to do this as quickly as possible so that we can start our testing again. Thank you. We've got it. Thank you so much. Anybody, anybody else? Anything? No. Thank you. And thank you for the Lake Water Quality Society. Um, and uh, we'll go on to the next um, item on our list, and that would be staff reports, the financial services quarterly report. Mr. Zackle. Thank you, Mayor McCordell. So this is uh, the status up to the end of the year. So the projected surplus for the town's general water and sewer is $2.1 million. Uh, financial update, uh, attached income statement and expenditures. Uh, projected surplus for the general fund was $1,429,437. Sewer was $283,892. And the water fund was $476,942. Um, Sun Bowl Arena, um, as per the attached income statement. Uh, due to COVID, revenue suffered significantly and they were down $84,253. Our expenditures were also under budget by $106,919. And this is mostly in the delay of purchasing the ice for surface or a pickup truck um, and some savings from utilities. Um, so we're still projecting a surplus of $22,665 for the Sun Bowl. For bylaws, uh, bylaw 1373, the permissive tax exemption bylaw was adopted October 12th. Bylaw 1374, sewer connection regulation bylaw was adopted December 24th or December 14th as well. Um, sewer user fees, water rates and regulations bylaw, and water district rates and regulations bylaws were also adopted in December 2021. Under FOI requests, we had uh, processed five FOI requests from the same um, individual um, that were processed in the fourth quarter of 2021. And there are three in process that will be completed in early 2022. Pending tax sales, as of December 31st, taxes and rears will become taxes, uh, delinquent taxes, and the properties with the delinquent taxes will be subject to tax sale on September 26, 2022, if the taxes are not paid. Our accounts receivable, we uh, issued 98 invoices in the quarter uh, with 39 accounts on the balances outstanding uh, right now for $196,334. $90,500 is, is current amounts owing and $107,112 is um, amounts that are 30 to 60 days outstanding. Um, as of February 4th, 45,700 of that was paid. Accounts payable process 1,452 invoices for 338 suppliers. Under cemetery, we had four plot sales, 14 interments, four memorial installations. Under cash receiving, we processed 644 payments for a total of 2,853,000. For property taxes, we had zero properties in delinquent. We have 24 properties in arrears for a balance of $60,625. 123 properties had a current balance, balance outstanding, which amounted to 232,500. 492 properties are set up under a pre authorized payment plan. 662 properties um, have prepayment balances on their accounts. Um, so we've got a prepayment balance of 937,000. Under utility billing, 25 properties with outstanding rural water um, for a total of a balance of 33,500. Four properties are set up under the prepayment plan, and we've got eight properties with outstanding rural sewer for a total balance of $3,284.
Well, we've got um, invitations under community information provided to council also allows the information to flow to the public. Organizationally, uh, nothing more to report for the quarter. Under budget, um, financial risk implications, no changes to the budget, but gives council an update throughout the year as to what's taken place. Um, like we said, projected surplus from December 2021 was general fund 1,439,000, sewer fund 2 million, or 283,000, waterfront 476,000, and the Sun Bowl Arena 22,000. Significant dates, quarterly update from the finance department to take place April 27th for January to March 2021. August 10th was April, um, April 10th, or August 10th, pardon me, was the April to June 2021. November 11th was July to September 21. And this meeting was for the October to December 2021. Um, so at this point, I'll turn it over to Council for questions. <clears throat> thank you very much. Go ahead. Yeah, thank Council you very much. Yeah. On your accounts receivable, uh, what type of bills would those be for being you know, outstanding? Just a lot of them will be for land property fees. Okay. Some of the most significant. Um, rural for a fire protection district there would have been a, another significant one. Um, PEP for our flooding um, or the fires during the summer, we we're working through the process on those. So those are the most significant. Okay, that's fine. And then after 90 days, uh, what do we do? Where do we just run them up, keep going? We've collected all of them as we go. Um, there's one receivable that um, we brought off that that's that took place at the four years ago. Um, so we're able to collect all of these funds. Um, there were three properties that had outstanding um, billings were for unsightly lot cleanups and those ones got transferred to their tax accounts. Um, so we've been very fortunate with respect to the receivables. The utility billings, that's separate. Yes, yeah, so the utility billings, if it's in the rural area, if the billings are not paid by January 10th of the following year, uh, we have the ability to transfer, transfer those funds to the surveyor of taxes, which they put that on the tax, tax notices. So in November of that year, mm -hmm. um, the town gets the money back for that. So, and then for the uh, town water, um, it's on the property tax notices. So that's okay. Thank you very much. Well, any other questions, concerns? Okay, well, thank you very much, Mr. Zackel, for providing that for us. And the next report that we have, and teach is the beard in preparation for, which is <laughs> discuss the water metering implementation uh, report. Go ahead, please, Mr. Zackel. Okay, Mr. Oh. Zackel's friend, Mr. Brownstein. Good. Uh, Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> one on one slide, one on the other. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, the, the intent of this report is actually to provide the, the implementation plan to Council for review and consideration. Um, what I will be doing is bringing this report back to the March 22nd meeting uh, for Council decision and direction. Um, what I'd like to do at this point is just give the opportunity for council that they have any preliminary questions or comments um, that may need to be addressed at the four second meeting that I can include in the staff report. It's overwhelming. That's that's number one. Uh, it's I, and I realize that we've been we've been talking about this for probably 10, 12 years about the need to to have this for one of the few areas. The last one I think in the Okanagan that does not have water metering. That being said, um, this is a horrendous cost. So um, is there any option of applying for grants to help with this? Or has that unfortunately worship has been pretty much exhausted? Um, the, the province has moved on from these type of, of grant funded activities. Um, there's no harm in, I, I mean, I guess we could try, um, but I have a feeling that we've, we've, we've had the verbal conversations with the province and they said, we're just not interested anymore in looking at funding metering implementation plans, which was done in most municipalities, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Go ahead. 
I guess, thank you, Mr. Friendman. Uh, these numbers like 4.7 4. million is like from 222, so I'm projecting this will be over 5 million when you come back from the. I mean, he sort of said they're 15 to 20 percent increase in cost. So, to the chair, Councillor King, um, no, that 4.7 million is hopefully 2023 2024 costs. Um, the original implementation costs, I think, were 3.2. Uh, we're already increased them to reflect that. Increase. Okay, so this is already yeah. included. Yeah. Thank you. Go ahead. Good there, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the $171,000 year for the operating, is that is that kind of, that's like for another person to do the metering and the vehicle and so, monitoring? That's going to be every year on top of that. So to the chair, to the council, I guess you are correct. That is on top of the capital initiative for 300 and some thousand dollars a year. Uh, we will be looking at an annual cost of 173 to continue to keep the program moving to replace meters as they come up to age to pay for that staff person who now is in charge of, of the water and water metering plan and keeping you know unfortunately you can't just put a meter in the ground and forget about it. Um, there's always ones that misread, there's ones that don't communicate, there's ones that have issues. There's some that come with um, faulty heads, now you gotta be able to replace the head. So there's, there's always a continuation of maintenance with meters as well to come and play and forget. The reason I ask that is I, I guess what I just come back from municipal insurance meetings and one of the big things they're concerned about is, is the downloading from the problems and this kind of stuff that's forcing the small towns to implement more and more of this stuff and give you more opportunity for claims and that kind of stuff. So that's one reason I mentioned it. So that $170,000 a year, they they say, well, put it in the meters, but they forget that some taxpayers have paid that $171,000 on top of that. So implementing is the easy part. Yep. Just like a meter might even build it or a tool as a cost to keep going. Yeah. So um, we do have some meters already in um, because new builds are required to put those in so but they're not they're not being charged yet but they are hooked up and is somebody keeping track of the information or so your worship yes there have been meters installed over the years um some are registered some are providing us information other ones are there and we we know about them but we don't know about them they are providing us any information because the meter was installed, but none of the reading technology was hooked up. Or they were installed at a time when um, radio reads were available, so they put in touch pads, and those touch pads are never connected. So when this meter implementation starts to happen, we have to go and evaluate every meter in our system to find out if it's not compatible with technology that's current. And there may be meters that we installed 10 years ago that we're now pulling out and putting in the new meter in order to provide us with the appropriate so any of these meters that are now even in the ground could be uh, could have to be redone. Is there is a possibility that your worship. I mean, meters installed in the last five years, highly unlikely. Five years and older, we may need to go in and do some do some replacements. Go ahead. Show an apartment block each suite would have their own meter. Uh, through the chair, of Councilor King. Uh, no, we'd be looking at actually putting bulk meters for multifamily. So it'd be one single meter for the property, and we would meter the property. How the strata de de defines the costs per individual unit would be 100% of the strata. Um, what I would like to see in the municipalities, one service, one property, one meter. Well, isn't there apartments that aren't strata though? Um, even if they aren't a strata, they're still, um, I guess, a multifamily unit. So we would still only build to the property line. So that property would be built as per the meter at the property line. Um, it cleans things up from a municipal perspective. Mm -hmm. You know, having to now go in and, and read, you know, a dozen to two dozen to three dozen meters. You're reading one meter, there's one to replace, there's one to maintain. You're not having to go into separate units or suites or look at a, a meter bank on the side of an apartment complex trying to figure out whose meter goes where. Um, I guess my question then how do you separate it on a build? You would so you'd build a property. So even a strata complex is I'm not talking strata. Yeah. Right? Okay, an apartment complex that's owned by one property owner and bought by a business would get a bill oh. a meter. Okay. Then how we ever get 
how he wants to divide that up between new records is yeah, he's at yeah. Um, yeah, I'm just looking at the time significant dates and timeline. Um, it doesn't show it explicitly, but I caution don't go out and hire $171,000 a year guy before the uh, electoral process because I have serious doubts about the success of that. So, no, I'm sure you wouldn't go and hire somebody without having the okay of moving forward on this. Or was that, what's the, how, how does that work? That totally makes sense. And so yeah. we put um, the whole process of um, ensuring our checks and balances are in place to communicate this first. And this is a huge amount <clears throat> of money on top of all the other water issues that we seem to take on um, more often. Um, it, it is, can it be spread out over several years or does it have to be done within um, two years? Or, uh, I, I wasn't sure about that. It looked like it was an amount for one year and an amount for the next year. And it, it so, can be spread out over a year to year, your worship. The problem is you're going to start seeing the cost escalate as you yeah. start to spread it out over a longer period of time. Um, that's always the, the risk you play when you start taking things too far out into the future. You start getting into uncertainty. Um, if you put this out for mm -hmm. a five year implementation plan, your four and five are going to be your most costly because that's the most amount of risk to any potential installer or contractor. They're going to bump up those last two years to oversight any risk. Mm -hmm. And thank you, man. Uh, is there like a warehouse of these meters or is there a backlog that you can't find any, any meters? Honestly, Custody, I have no idea. I uh, haven't done that. So it might get spread out yet. over four or five years. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well it's um, it's too bad that we didn't do it years ago. However, you know, there were probably a million other things that we were doing instead uh, because we seem to take on more and more projects every year. Um, thank you for providing this. Um, we've got two weeks to the more to sort of think about it and decide how to proceed but um wow it's a it's a huge one on top of everything else go ahead so Jack, out of uh, or for the um, annual operating increase would you be projecting that this is going to start at the end of the fourth quarter of 2025 uh, so, after all the meters are installed or so the staff member was already included in the five-year financial plan as of this year okay mm -hmm. Um, that extra money above and beyond would start probably, yes, once the implementation plan is complete. So at the end of 2024, um, that extra requirement above the staff member would be, would be needed. Okay, so it's not the full 171,000 that, that we'd be increasing. That's correct. So the staff member has already been included in the five-year financial plan at this point. Okay. But that, that extra... $50,000 would be included after that implementation. Okay, and that's what's important to council is what, uh, what's a new dollars being asked for. So has any of the implementation other than the 171 been included in the five-year financial plan? The, the staff position, the finance technician, I believe it's called, yes. uh, for water resort, um, that, that part is already uh, started, so. But servicing, servicing the projected debt is not included. No. Well, we got it in our five year financial plan, but at the old old numbers. So, what we need to do is do a financial plan amendment number one, just to get the numbers in there. And then, number two is we need to go through the elector approval process to um, see if the elector is even willing to do that. So, okay. So you might yeah. just want to clarify. Yeah. So the the the, the ops tech was not just the water implementation, water metering implementation was to do other things as well. This was just a, an aspect of that goals requirements. Now this council wish to build an eight fill in that position and get that done the electoral approval. Um, the idea of getting that position on board prior to doing any of this is that position would now assist in getting all of this implemented and moving forward. Mm -hmm. 
I guess I you know I I didn't read every page of Drew's uh, report, but I did give it a good look, and it looks to me a full time position for metering, implementation, and then uh, upkeep and management. And I don't think this project can go ahead based on electoral approval. That's everybody's crystal ball is different, but I, I have serious doubts about the success of this. And hiring a staff position, which looks full time for this, we shouldn't be doing. Uh, if, if you want a new staff position uh, uh, for other things that, that's going to keep them busy, you know, I guess we would want to report, but uh, mm -hmm. it reads to me like a full time position. Okay. Um, we've got two more weeks to mull it over and worry about it at night. Yes. I just have one other question. Um, Jim, with the uh, with this meter information, I thought we had to do it. If the voters say no, and the government says you have to. That was the best stuff in the chair. But to the chair, the, the council about it. Metering is not a re provincial requirement that we must do. Um, however, metering is going to benefit from a, us from a capital perspective in the future. So if we don't meter, um, the council has to look at a new production line, uh, probably three to $4 million. Um, the water treatment plant that has been suspect and budgeted for took metering into account for demands. If metering does not go ahead, there is a cost associated with now making that plant bigger. I don't have numbers at the top of my head for that, but you can probably guess three or $4 million more to make that plant larger to accommodate the demands that we are not now reducing in the metering. So it, it's a catch 22. Um, if we don't meter, there are capital things over here that need to now happen. If we do meter, I can now delay some of those capital things off, you know, 10, 15 years. Um, so either you deal with the headache now of, of metering and going down that cost, or I'm going to be Unfortunately, coming knocking on the door over here in a couple of months asking for, you know, four million bucks for a new well and, you know, another four or five million dollars to upgrade our water treatment plant in order to accommodate the production that was reduced due to metering. So I, so I think that <clears throat> that's a case, that's the kind of stuff we have to have compared to the public in, in their language when they do this reverse thing. So I understand. Yeah, and that was the idea of, of bringing, yeah. unfortunately, the staff member on, on board was to go do all that, please educate the community, tell them why we're doing this, provide all the information, you know, for lack of a better term, sell it to them and let them know that this is why we're doing it. Not just we want water meters because we want water meters. No, we're trying to for this capital and this capital and this capital to later on when, you know, demand requires it. Um, you know, the mayor says all the time we live in a desert. Um, we need to reduce our water consumption to reflect the fact that we live in a desert. And I, I agree with um, Councillor Harvey is, you know, this is going to be a hard sell to the public. Um, this is a, a large amount of money to say, hey, you know, we need to borrow to make this happen. Unfortunately, that 4.7 million here may defer up to eight or nine million over here that we don't have the capital to do, which we're borrowing for anyway. And so that was the, the idea of the position was to be able to provide that. Uh, I'd bring staff in contract. my contract. Yeah. Uh -huh. see then. As opposed to the staff. Just because, sure. you know, I, I, I supported it. I'm just skeptical of the outcome of the work. I get it. Well, do you remember when uh, the fire department, three of them, um, did a, an amazing job of educating the public in order to sell the fire hall, the new fire hall, which, uh, and that was, I don't know, eight, nine years ago. And that was that was quite a procedure to go through all of that and and figure out how you could convince people that 
it was needed for this reason. So absolutely education and having people understand what the issues are and why it's essential has to be priority. Um, okay, well, we get to, yeah. I thought it was mandated by the province for water meters because we've kind of taken it to the end in the valley. I think we're one of the last towns without meters. And there was a rationale that we could extend it with a certain date, and then we had to do it. Not that I'm aware of Councillor King, but I will definitely do some research in regards to that. Um, the big push by the municipalities put meters in was the fact that they got grant funding to do it. Oh, okay. So, you know, at 80 cent dollars, yeah. all of a sudden metering became economically viable. Right. Whereas, and unfortunately, we missed that boat, and now we're having to come in the other direction to now get rid of these things. And then you hinted also that with the population growth, we might need another well in four or five years, excluding water meters. There is that, but then that's a growth based thing uh, instead of a current usage type thing. Um, right now, um, unfortunately, with demands on our system, if I have a well go down, uh, we're all going on stage for water restrictions. Now, yes, and you won't be watering anything. <laughs> but so, I mean, yeah, I also hear like there's usually a big decrease in water consumption the first year because everybody's nervous yep. what they use, yep. and then say it goes down 30 percent, then next year it goes back up 20 percent. But so you're still saving 10 percent, yeah. Usually, on average, after meeting, you see about 20 percent of your water consumption. So, your first year, yes, you get the sticker shock, everybody stopped watering, or that's what you see that dramatic drop in demand yeah then you just have a bounce back a bit um some municipalities only see the drop by 10 maybe 15 percent because people say well can't put water i'm gonna use it and it depends on the the type of people you're dealing with within your community is whether or not they feel that because they're paying for the commodity well i'm going to use as much as i want because i'm paying for it yeah and other people well you know it costs me money so i'm going to stop using it so eventually you get to that nice fine balance where everybody's Consuming water like they should, not like they want. So, so right now you have no recollection of how much water is used in this town. Not off the top of my head. Um like through a, a well, you'd know sort of how much got pumped through there in a year. Yeah, that I can tell you. Well, I don't need the number, I just yeah. want to know if you have access yeah. to yeah. So, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, <clears throat> so when we come back. For the next meeting to approve this report is this report we're approving it based on these dollars and then we put it in just to get in the budget and but we don't spend our money now we have that so we have all of our approvals in place if there's borrowing required um yes. we will need to follow through with the borrowing bylaw now with water borrowing um, we can do the borrowing without elector approval, but because it's potentially a very contentious issue, having the electors do the approval process is a good thing. But sometimes when you see, at, at least for water, if you see the need or council sees the need, we don't have to do that because of our with council. We're very, very fortunate with that. But water meeting, metering is really um, a different so, so when Jeremy, this report is going to vote on, or is there going to be two? So there will be there will be a subsequent meeting. report coming to to a regular council meeting next. Yeah, so sorry, what Brian said, including in the change in the one seventy one to. That's <clears throat> already in. But you, you want yeah, to some of it's some of it's in. Yeah. So basically, we'll be looking at council's permission to start the process. Start looking at electoral approval, getting borrowing bylaws drafted and in place, and all the stuff that needs to be done before we can go and say, you know, we're going to go borrow 4.7 million yeah. in initial capital costs after the 20 years is closer to six and a half. But you know, and okay. the financial plan would have to be amended to include the numbers um, as well. So we do know that there's also the opportunity for public to have an opportunity to speak the amended. Financial mind, so uh, that's well. Okay. On other okay. water issues, we've had uh, interior health involved because they have said we need to do certain things. 
that they don't they're not involved in this one. Okay, yep. thanks. No, this is not a water quality question. Yeah, this is a water consumption question. Okay. Don't invite them. <laughs> <laughs> they hear about it. We need their approval on other stuff. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Brownstein. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's a lot for us to think about, but that's why we get paid the big money, right? Yeah, I just got to have you look back on the report because Councillor Bennett mentioned the same thing. I thought we were mandated by the province to put meters in. And we stalled it to the very end that we had to had nothing to do with grants, or we would have, I think, submitted some grants at that time. So you might want to look into that. Just I, I will counsel you know whether we're because that, that, that. that's when we finally decided to go for it. We had to. Yep. Yeah. I'll look into that. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, I don't think we have any other business today, so. I will um, ask for someone to move that we terminate the meeting. Sure. Councillor King loves to terminate meetings. Councillor Bennett, are you seconding that? Sure. All in favor. Thanks very much, everybody. No, no, no. See you at two.